the biggest thesis back then and even now is that Web3 isn't secure enough. Facebook wanted to build a stable coin um, to power Facebook itself. That was the DM leader project. They looked at the EVM, looked at the SVM and decided that it wasn't good enough. So the language itself, it's a lot easier to write code. There's actually some diagram that shows like to write account checks uh, for a full module, it takes an SVM like two pages, it takes an EVM like five pages, it takes like the movie on like 10 lines. If we ever have more than like a thousand users on chain, the EVM chain simply can't handle the load because you're waiting for one thread. What parallelization enables use at multiple threads. So if you have 10 transactions, instead of waiting for A to B to C to D, you can do A transaction, transaction B, transaction C, transaction D, all at the same time because you have multiple threads within the VM. This episode is brought to you by Gnosis. Gnosis builds decentralized infrastructure for the Ethereum ecosystem. With a rich history dating back to 2015 and products like Safe, CowSwap, or Gnosis Chain, Gnosis combines needs-driven development with deep technical expertise. This year marks the launch of Gnosis Pay, the world's first decentralized payment network. With the Gnosis card, you can spend self-custody crypto at any Visa accepting merchant around the world. If you're an individual looking to live more on chain or a business looking to white label the stack, visit GnosisPay.com. There are lots of ways you can join the Gnosis journey. Drop in the Gnosis DAO governance form, become a Gnosis validator with a single GNO token and low-cost hardware, or deploy your product on the EVM-compatible and highly decentralized Gnosis chain. Get started today at Gnosis.io. Cars One is one of the biggest node operators globally and help you stake your tokens on 45-plus networks like Ethereum, Cosmos, Celestia, and DYDX. More than 100,000 delegators stake with Chorus One, including institutions like BitGo and Ledger. Staking with Chorus One not only gets you the highest yields, but also the most robust security practices and infrastructure that are usually exclusive for institutions. You can stake directly to Chorus One's public node from your wallet, set up a white label node, or use the recently launched product, Opus, to stake up to 8,000 ETH in a single transaction. You can even offer high-yield staking to your own customers using their API. Your assets always remain in your custody, so you can have complete peace of mind. Start staking today at Chorus.one. Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization in the blockchain revolution. I'm Sebastian Couture, and I'm here with my co-host, Felike Ernst. Today, we're talking to Rushi Mancha. He's the co-founder at Movement Labs. They're a network of move-based modular blockchains. Uh, before we talk to Rushi, just want to disclose that Movement Labs is a portfolio company of Interop Ventures. Uh, but with that out of the way, hey, Rushi, thanks for joining us. How's it going, guys? Pleasure to be on here. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we were just talking before the show about like ETH Denver, and uh, I think this is the first episode to come out after the conference, or maybe the second. But yeah, you, you, we were both there wearing the movement uh, sweatshirt, which is very comfy. Yeah. What were your impressions about ETH Denver and, you know, compared to last year, like how do you think the space has evolved? I mean, the short answer is we're back. Um, last year it was like kind of dreary because like post FTX, I think it was like three months after FTX and all the debacles and everyone was like pretty down bad. If you were there, you were like in it for the like actual long, long term. There weren't that many side events. Uh, weren't that many parties, weren't that many like fun things, which is a blessing and a curse. I think last year we saw a lot more like builders coming to the market and actually presenting some cool novel ideas. And there was more signal than noise. And then at Denver, there's a lot of signal, but even more so noise, especially with the rise of the crypto and AI narrative. Um, but seeing a lot of those decks flowing around, honestly, we have had a difficult try to filter out what's real and what's not real. But more importantly, I think it's like great to see the public market, like obviously the market's back. Bitcoin's all-time high, um, price action's doing well, private markets are going crazy, um, so the excitement's back. I think that was really great to see, um, but I think it's important to know, like, you have to be kind of wary because I think we're heading way too fast in the upwards direction, like, even before the happening, um, Bitcoin's all-time high, which creates a lot of, like, macroeconomic questions for how long um, this bull can last as a super cycle and whatnot. Um, so as, like, a builder, it's very important to, like, A, focus on distribution, keep, like, capitalize the market but also remaining like conscious that 
it's probably not going to be a long-term thing and maybe so economics is sh- like suggesting it's a short-term thing um so that kind of adjusts timelines i think a lot of different um infrastructure companies are paying attention to the markets in terms of timelines for product launches and whatnot um so that's one side of the story i think some key defining narratives you had like ai crypto and ai obviously like intersection as a core narrative um obviously nvidia is going crazy right now which trickles down to the private markets um and the like modularity which is still retaining from last year um i think 2023 we saw a lot of da focused modularity so you had like celestia eigen avail um and then this year we put on like modular day as kind of the flagship event um and really focused on the vm level experimentation um so i moved vm svm um was in vm and a few different groups uh, really come to market and explain why alternatives to vm are important um and then restaking obviously is a big narrative that um eigen's been pushing on looking forward to the launch yeah, I, I felt like ETH Denver this year could have been just like modular week. It, it felt like every event had a modular twist to it or was either like about modular or had like pe- people giving panels about about the modular uh, thesis and the modular stack and like Avail had an event, Celestia had an event, you guys had an event uh, and and tons of other sort of like more Ethereum aligned uh, teams were, were doing events on, on modular. Like how how important do you think modular is to to the current cycle and in terms of narratives you know like what amount of developer mind share do you think it's actually capturing versus what the markets are saying like how, how the markets are perceiving it a modular is now used as a good market term um it's like modular alignment where you want to structure your company to be interoperable with other networks and systems um, which I think is a good thing. Like if you look at traditional tech or even traditional like hardware, the, 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 the companies that won were the companies that are able to build um, parts and hardware that's interoperable with other ecosystems uh, that wasn't tied into one vendor lock in. I think that's what we're seeing in Web3 where if you're building AI, if you're building oracles, if you're building infrastructure, um, you want to be able to tie into different ecosystems, different chain, go cross chain or multi-chain. Um, and interoperate because you have a bigger client base, have bigger marketing exposure. Um, so I think mo- modular now is a marketing term where if you're an infrastructure, if you're an app, you want to be modular so you can align with different ecosystems. Where it's, if it's actually a modular, that's yet to be determined. Probably not, honestly. Um, modular in this case probably refers to using all DA, using experimental different like VM levels. But I've seen like modular be used for like RPCs, be used for um, like even like APIs. Um, so I think modular is like a bigger landscape, which gives credit to Celestia. They've turned their narrative into like a meta um, and it allows if like a bunch of different companies to align under like one unified umbrella. And we'll get into the entire modular stack in just a bit, Roshi. But it is your first time on Epicenter. So maybe uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and how you got into this and what, what made you start Movement Labs. Yeah, so my background is engineering. Um, started coding when I was 14. I was always interested in distributed systems, technology, and whatnot. Um, started software engineering. I worked at United Health Group, led on from databases and cloud migration for a team over there. Um, got into that pretty early on. Then somewhere across crypto, was really interested in all programming languages, especially Rust based programming languages. So Kazawazam, Rust, Move was really exciting to me. Um, from there, uh, me and my co founder, Cooper, we were both at Vanderbilt University. Uh, which is a university in the south of the United States. Um, I, he was a few years older than me, but um, I was building one of the first decks in Aptos. He built Sate, the first yield dragger in Aptos. So we were early move builders. This was August of 2022. Um, so pre-FTX, um, back when like things were better um, in that cycle. And then we wanted to bring, like, like we love move language. I think I stumbled across it because uh, I read like a New York Times article or some like block article where I was like, Facebook's doing this uh, blockchain programming language and their new blockchain initiative. And it got me excited because I was always interested in blockchains, but I was always concerned of security and it would it ever scale to mainstream consumers. And Facebook is the biggest consumer app on the planet. And they took a bet on um, programming and started Move Language. So I built the first Dex and to us. That ultimately led to uh, Movement because we wanted to bring the Move VM to Ethereum. Um, I get more to the Move side, but uh, that's kind of how I got here. Yeah, super cool. Yeah, let's get into the Move side. So basically, Move is a language, as you said, created by Facebook um, to to be more dev friendly, more 
more secure than um, Solidity and the likes of Solidity, like Viper. It's been used for, li for, for Libra and DM, obviously, uh, but kind of Sui and Aptos are the main chains that kind of build on it today. T tell us um, what kind of sets move apart from, say, Solidity. Yes, I think going back to the root, Facebook wanted to build a stable coin um, to power Facebook itself. That was a DM and Libra project. They looked at the EVM, looked at the SVM, and decided that it wasn't good enough. They needed their own infrastructure, needed a VM and language that could scale for billions of users, as well as provide security for on-chain. The biggest thesis back then, and even now, is that Web3 isn't secure enough. If I ever want my mom or anyone in my family to use crypto, um, the biggest thing they're saying is, is it going to get hacked? Isn't there going to be rugs? Isn't there like a lot of scams going on? And Moo was kind of built to combat that from the smart contract level. So it stops like 90, 95% of attack vectors we're seeing today in the EVM. Um, as well as provide solvency for some of the attacks we're seeing in SVM as well. Um, so, like some, so that's kind of the root and origin cost. And then we kind of bring into like why move the thesis is A, was built by the biggest consumer app, bringing in new Web2 developers. Uh, over the next two or three years, you'll see Sweden app does use their big treasuries um, to attract consumer apps and consumer builders um, to bring net new developers to the ecosystem. As on the language itself, it was designed to be a blockchain first language. The analogy I like to say is like Move is to Rust as React is to JavaScript. If you follow um, JavaScript's history in Web2, um, it came to market. No one really liked writing JavaScript. Um, and then React came to market and made website generation much easier. Like you can sign custom components. Um, you're like object oriented. Um, same thing with Move. It's people don't really like writing Rust, they like the frameworks on top of it. Um, so Move, v, the Move and the Move VM is a framework. You can think of it on top of Rust where you can design modules that are very custom. You can have on-chain advanced for your attack protection. Um, so the language itself, it's a lot easier to write code. There's actually some diagram that shows like to write account checks uh, for a full module. It takes like, the SVM like two pages. It takes the EVM like five pages. It takes like the movie on like 10 lines, as well as you have embedded uh, on-chain protection. So you have the move prover at the VM level, which stops risk G, stops intro overflows. Um, it stops all the attack vectors we're seeing today in crypto. Um, so it's the most important innovation security while also being paralyzed. So it touches in the paralyzed narrative. Um, Block STM was actually built by Aptos Labs um, as pioneered by Monad and a few other groups. Um, so think of like the best, the fastest VM and your favorite auditor combined into one VM at one time. The EVM and Solidity in particular, I mean, they are pretty low level and they let you do a lot of things that other programming languages like Move don't let you do. Yep. Um, so, for instance, things like inline assembly or something like yep. Move would never let you do this, right? But the reason why it was devised this way was to give developers more freedom in kind of um, optimizing for things like uh, gas cost, right? Um, so, d w with kind of this more prescriptive language that Move is, you are also somewhat tied down in in you know in in terms of what you can actually do especially in kind of um, a distributed system such as kind of um, a blockchain ecosystem does this concern you that you can't kind of optimize for things as well as you could in the more permissive languages i think going back to the web to example like you don't have the flexibility with reactor v or angular um, it's simply the best framework to build and design websites if you really want customizations, you can go at like C++ level, you can like generate your own um, kind of Ruby on Rails frameworks. Um, that's more design specific, um, like mega use cases. I think there's two sides of argument here. A, move increases the velocity of production. So let's say, for example, um, I'm a 24 year old kid. I, will want, I want to launch my own um, DeFi app in two weeks. Move is the best way to do that because you can get to market quickly. You can write code quickly. You don't have to worry about account checks. Um, you don't have to worry about keep debugging. Um, so it's the easiest way to sprint on product development. If you do want low-level customizations, the Mubi system is actually working on um, a lot of the inline assembly and um, integrating assembly directly into the Move language. Obviously, it's a nascent language. It was launched like a year ago, so there's a lot of fixes and optimizations are happening. Um, but over the next three or four years, I'd imagine that um, Move also adopts a similar low-level support. Um, I think the app test team is working on this as well as we're looking into it as well. Uh, we actually look at it at the bytecode level. So you can actually directly write Yule, um, which is like a, a assembly language directly to our VM. Um, that's part of our tech stack that kind of differentiates it from Aptos and Sui. We've made it fully even compatible. So 
you can take the silly code, do the 145 opcodes, and map it to the 54 move opcodes, and launch the VM. Between that process, it's, we have an abstract syntax tree, which enables runtime and SDK to understand your bytecode, but also if you are a very talented developer and you want a customization at a smart contract level and you want to use assembly, you can write you will directly to the interpreter. No, that's super interesting. I, I had no idea that was happening. How, how do you feel about the um, mind share advantage for the EVM? Obviously, the EVM has been around a lot longer and there's tooling and people know it and uh, there's tutorials and so on. Do you think this can be overcome by kind of like the um, the sort of treasuries that Facebook and Aptos and Sui and so on put into it? I think it's not a, comp it's not a PVP. It's, they both exist. If you want to use Lido today, uh, EVM is the best place to use it and will be the best place to use it for the next five years. But the thing that the stance is the EVM, how I approach is legacy code. It is code that works really well for past use cases. Um, when we had a thousand users on chain, Move is designed for billions of users on chain. It was designed for Facebook to be on chain, which is why you have parallelization, but also you have security benefits. So it's actually complementary, such that, that you have the EVF legacy code um, and legacy software for early um, kind of web implementations. You can think about Bitcoin script still supports um, people still use it for various use cases. But if you ever want to do on chain consumer, on chain social, um, any actual use case that requires high throughput applications as well as security, you need to use a framework like Move. How Move approaches is we recognize the shortcomings of, of um, Move itself in terms of a new language as well as the network effects of EVM, and we combine it. So we have an MEVM where you have Move support as well as EVM support. So if you're looking to deploy Lido on chain or like Aave on chain or Uniswap on chain today, you can use the EVM runtime and interpreter. If you want to build the next uh, biggest consumer app, you can use the Move SDK as well. Um, I think that's the best way to approach next-gen VMs, which is what I think a lot of different groups messed up on. A lot of layer ones and next gen VMs were like, this is our programming language, this is our framework. It's the best thing. If you don't use it, you can screw off. And then they lost a lot of developers. It was difficult to track liquidity. For us, we are acknowledging that EVM still has a liquidity. We want to fully support and are actually being as Ethereum line as possible while supporting moving long term um, and supporting proliferating its growth. You talked about parallelization um, a couple of times there. Can you kind of go into what that means? So, in traditional EVM or any other stack, you have sequential processing, which means you have transact if you have 10 transactions, it's transaction A to B to C to D. Um, so within a given VM, you're waiting for a transaction to finish for one single thread. Typically in today's crypto environment, sometimes it's not a big deal. If you're using Lido, um, like you'll have $5 gas fees or whatnot, um, which for some users for like big whales, it's fine. If you have a million dollars on chain, you pay $5 gas fees, um, they don't really care. Um, but what parallelization enables you at multiple threads. So if you have 10 transactions, instead of waiting for A to B to C to D, you can do A transaction, transaction B, transaction C, transaction D, all at the same time because you have multiple threads within the VM. It was first started with like the block STM process, uh, which Aptos Pioneer, which is a new form of parallel processing uh, that enables high throughput um, parallelized threads. Why is really important is for two reasons. A, you want low gas fees. So if you look at um, near, if you look at SWE, say, um, they have next to nothing gas fees, which is from parallelization. Um, while if you look at the EVM, you still have Ethereum, which hits like $50 gas fees. Even layer twos today are pretty expensive and they require layer 3s to scale. My thesis is that layer 3s don't make sense if you have a parallelized layer 2 because you can have multiple threads um, that can handle a managed state. The second thing is on, um, if you look at inscriptions as the best use case of parallelization, Every EVM chain went down, like ZK, like ZK Singing Arbor chain went down 120 TPS. If the, if the chain didn't go down like Avalanche, it was at like $50 gas fees, which means that if, if we ever have more than like 1,000 users on chain, the EVM chain simply can't handle the load because you're waiting for one thread. Think about logic here, right? If you have a high uh, impact event like uh, inscriptions or a game going crazy on one thread um, and you have Uniswap on the same thread, it's going to cause the gas fees for Uniswap to go up. Or if there's a world where you can have multiple threads and you have gas fees go crazy on one thread, but it doesn't affect Uniswap, doesn't affect DYDX, doesn't affect GMX and other threads. So you can actually have modularity within the threads itself instead of requiring constant infrastructure upgrades um, that make no sense at scale. So long story short, parallelization enables concurrent transaction processing, which allows for low gas fees, as well as allows for a management of state during t times of high network activity. Uh, there's a lot to unpack here. So I think some of these things 
in the Ethereum ecosystem are being tackled by um, intense space transactions, right? What's your take on those? I think intense space transactions pretty early on. I know like, Shogun is trying to do something for them, like the Magic system. I know One Inch is also trying to push towards that. Um, the general thesis with that, it's like very early stage. It's yet to be proven um, because there's a lot of interoperability problems. If you try to intense between like an EVM chain um, on one like layer two and another layer two, like across is probably the biggest one here. Um, it's very difficult to do like bridging standards and there's a lot of security assumptions they're making. Um, but I would say, like, yes, in the EVM world, Intense is another way to tackle that, um, but still the fees are generally high, and there's still um, like just because like just because cross has intense built to the bridging doesn't mean um, it can handle high load. If that was the case, um, like inscriptions wouldn't have taken that chains. And so basically, um, when you talk about parallelization, I mean basically we used to have this this idea in Ethereum that I very much hope is going to return at some point with with, with kind of like smart shards. Um, where basically you have where you have individual execution environments with local states that kind of can um, interact async with one another. When you have stacks that natively do parallelization, how do you handle the state? How do you make sure that you kind of have one ledger? How do you deal with security? Well, I think that's one of the benefits of using Ethereum's layer two, as you inherit the network security and the balance that. Um, and the kind of decentralization that Ethereum has already built. And you put the move VM on top of that um, and bring parallelization to Ethereum, which is why I think it's very, like, the vision for Ethereum is actually to bring parallelization to the VM level because you can inherit security, manage state bloat through the uh, settlement and D layers while you have VMs that can provide performance parallelization. You have, like, parallelized EVMs coming now to Ethereum. You have SVMs, move VMs. Um, so there's definitely like a rise of these virtual machines, but they're all saying that Ethereum is still the best managed place to manage state um, and store data. I'll uh, hand off to to Seb here. Sorry for the for the uh, intense inter interrogation here from the EVM camp. No, these are these are all great questions. I, I love it. Uh, I was just watching and uh, and uh, really enjoying that whole exchange. I mean, you know, to kind of bounce back on what you were saying, Rishi. You know, in terms of you know the EVM being legacy code, I sometimes equate to EVM, and I know this this analogy doesn't overlap exactly, but look at the EVM and Solidity a little bit as I do, you know, PHP. PHP has been around for over 20 years. It, it is still powering something like 60 to 70% of websites on the internet, uh, you know, most of which are WordPress websites and Facebook. Uh, however, you know, ask a college kid today or like a young engineer what language he's building with, like he's probably using, you know, like Node.js and React and all these sort of new uh, Web2 frameworks and, and not PHP. So I, I sort of look at the EVM and Solidity in the same, uh, from the same perspective where I think the EVM will continue to power very important applications and DeFi will continue to power these, you know, sort of legacy applications that uh, are going to be, uh, you know, very, very important to Ethereum and sort of crypto in infrastructure moving forward. But, you know, as the space moves towards a more modular uh, uh, ecosystem stack, uh, new VMs that are better suited uh, for for that uh, for that infrastructure will probably prevail in those ecosystems. Is that a good way to look at it, or is that analogy missing missing some parts? No, I think that makes perfect sense. Like, I could like touch on like the EVM has done a great job of bootstrapping the initial crypto user base um, and use cases for DeFi, um, but there still is a lot of challenges. So that's why these all VMs are coming. Um, either for performance, security, and a bunch of other different trade-offs um, to kind of scale existing Ethereum use cases. Um, but like liquid with, with Web2 is kind of different where you have, if you have a novel new tech stack, if you have a cool new website, and you can essentially vampire attack the existing like user base and bring it over pretty quickly, probably within a two or three month time span. That's not really possible in crypto because you have financial incentives. So if you have like 5 billion locked up on one each system, it's very difficult to migrate and essentially take all the liquidity over to a new nascent ecosystem, um, which is why um, it's, it's more of like a long-term horizon where you'll see liquidity slowly move to like Solana, which is why like Solana has been kind of crushing in. Um, it's been steadily growing TBLs with Aptos and Sui. So we're slowly seeing that liquidity and users can move over to the next gen VMs, but it's still going to be like a 10 year process probably before the EVM is at least completely challenged. Um, so I think the current state of execution environments is you acknowledge the EVM 
acknowledge the liquidity benefits it has while it's trying to try to create different use cases for these alt VMs, make sure those use cases actually reach fruition and then slowly work on acquiring the even liquidity once you prove that. Um, I think the two main contenders are this SVM and then Move VM. Um, a, which have a huge system backing uh, from pre-existing level ones, and B, have specific teams that are carrying out um, the all VM to VM ecosystem. So maybe just like playing devil's advocate here, like what do you make of the fact that you know, Barrett Chain is launching an EVM chain. Uh, you know, Say also is, I, I think, now dropping Cosm Wasm uh, to, uh, to favor a paralyzed EVM in, in order to, you know, attract more developers. I think they've found it difficult to attract Cosm Wasm developers. You know, if, if this is all true and if, like, Move and, and, and Solana VM are better suited to uh, this kind of new era of blockchain applications... Why are you know these very large, like especially Barry Chain, right? Those like large ecosystem play putting the EVM first. Uh, I'll touch on the same point of view where the paralyzed EVM I would contend is not the same as the EVM. It's a completely redesigned rich machine. It's just even compatible. You can argue that our MEVM is a paralyzed EVM, um, even though it's a completely different rich machine. So I think the paralyzed EVM is I would consider also as a next gen VM, um, because it's a complete redesigned rich machine. Just has EVM compatibility from the start. Um, there are security issues with Solidity, but um, Say isn't really prioritizing that because their go to market is being a trading first chain, um, being a high throughput chain. So they don't really care uh, for optimizing for smart contract security. Um, so the, the simple answer to the Say example, the Mana example is those are completely different EVMs or BMs. I would not say they're current EVM. Um, they're actually like the Mana EVM or the Say EVM, which is completely different. Um, so it still ties in the next gen thesis. And then as for Bear Chain, I would say that's like the main value prop there is a community. They've done a great job of assembling um, maybe the most vibrant community in crypto today. Um, and a lot of their activity is based on this proof of liquidity consensus uh, where it actually doesn't make sense to use a next gen VM because they don't really care about speed. They don't really care about um, security as much. They're more focused on using governance and using the liquid staking um, and restaking narrative. Um, but I know, for example, like talking to the team and different teams there, Throughput is a concern for them because um, even like mempool went down recently, it probably won't be able to do more than like 50 TPS at scale. Um, so it's, we're actually going to be working with Bergen and bringing the movie VM to their system. Um, probably more experimental and down the roadmap, but um, for any game that wants to launch a Bergen, it simply probably won't work. It probably needs to like scale an exclusion for that. Yeah, so therefore like Bergen will sort of act as a, a security layer for L2s and, and, uh, and other app chains that want to leverage... Con- bear chain security yep cool let's let's talk about the stack um so you know admittedly there are there are different parts of the stack here that you know, i mean even for me sometimes like it's, uh, it can still be a little bit confusing so you know there's m1 there's m2 and the idea here is for like m1 to act as you know the sort of like layer one that uh that enables m2 chains uh, and roll-ups to to launch on top of it can you explain like broadly what the stack looks like and um, where, and also you know, maybe zooming out, like where these different components sit within the modular stack. If we bring in like now Celestia and Eigenlayer, uh, maybe like Union for interoperability, you know, if we were looking at a sort of infographic of this, like what would that look like? Yeah, so we can start with top down. So execution layer, you have the movement VM, which is the DM salvage machine, supports move smart contracts as well as supports EVM smart contracts. So it's an EVM interpreter that's eventually a transition to transpiler um, that exists on top of SDK. So any smart contracts, whether you're in Move or Slurdy, can exist on the execution layer. Settlement is Ethereum. Um, we believe that's the best security and decentralization. Also enables liquidity to easily flow to layer two um, through a trust minimized bridge. The kind of stack of framework we're using is a zero knowledge rollup. We're using um, Verse Zero right now for ZK fraud proofs, um, but also looking to scope out our own. Um, ZK Move VM Proving Kit. Um, so you have Move VM uh, Execution, ZKM Settlement, ZK Fraud Proofs um, as kind of the rollup for framework. And then right now we're using Celestia for DA, um, given that's the one that's live today, as well as allows for um, cold data to be pushed directly to DA and say use a lot of gas fees. Um, so it's kind of like this Frankenstein of like different layers, which is kind of the direction I, I think a lot of different rollups are heading to. Um, and last bit is on the sequencer portion. I think today's centralized sequencers cannot scale and do not scale. I think most people agree 
if you look at inscriptions, like it like broke every sequence that exists. Um, and the simple reason that Arbitrum, ZK Sync, and these other teams aren't innovating is because they're making a lot of money on sequencer fees. Uh, because we're a next gen rollup, our fees are basically pennies. So we don't actually prioritize sequencer fees. We have a fully decentralized sequencer day one um, that enables validators to stick the move token to participate in sequencing of the layer two. So it's a fully decentralized uh, layer two network um, where the transaction fees are distributed to stakeholders. Stakeholders take the token to participate in sequencing. Um, so it actually is like a bridge between like a layer one and layer two in that sense. How how do you deal with um, the decentralized sequencing? Because if you kind of look at the L2 stack on Ethereum right now, no one's really figured this out yet, right? So basically the S stack are the people who are, who are saying, look, we're not going to do this without, but uh, they're also saying they'll probably launch earliest in a year or so. Yeah, so I think a lot of groups like Orbitrum based setter, they've all announced like Optimism Superchain is a sequencer. I think they've all announced that they want to do a decentralized sequencer, but like I touched on, there is no economic incentive for them to prioritize it because they're making a lot of money on sequencer fees. So it's always like, okay, we'll eventually do that or we'll work with a third party, but the third party never really works out. Um, so it's always been pushed back. Uh, for us, it's a directly a priority, A, because we're a high throughput chain. So we need to have a decentralized sequencer to manage the load balancing the network. And then B, that's our token business model. We need a decentralized sequencer for the validators to have staking privileges, which actually accrues value and buy pressure for the token. Um, so that means we're actually prioritizing as a core part of our tech stack. I think Metis is another one, or Mode, one of those um, that has started and launched with a decentralized sequencer. Um, and I think we'll see a lot more of this come. I think Astra is also launching their new layer two of the decentralized sequencer. So teams that prioritize decentralized sequencers will be able to sprint to market, while teams that don't prioritize it have no incentive to do so. Um, can, can you walk us through how it works? So the only the only technical implementation that I'm aware of um, is the one that Cello is pushing, kind of who, who are moving from like an L1 to an L2 network. So how how do you go about it? Yeah, so I think we have a very similar approach to Cello. Cello had a layer one. They now are approaching this like layer two on the ZK Validium. All the valors from Cello were layer one to layer one, stake the seller token to participate in sequencing for the seller layer two. Um, so that kind of works how we have it, right? So we have M1, which is both less dynamic consensus. For those that aren't familiar, it's from the Avalanche system. Um, that's essentially a fast finality, um, extremely low hardware requirements, uh, and very decentralized consensus mechanism. That's our sequencer, value stake the move token to participate in sequencing for the layer two. Um, the benefits of using Snowman there is leaderless. Um, it, when you want to queue transactions, you can have multiple different nodes. So if one node goes down, the network doesn't go down. You don't have a centralized point of failure. Um, and then B, anyone can run a node for the network. So the issues like Solana apps and Swedes, the hardware requirements are very high. The minimum stakes are very high. Um, so it's very centralized in that sense. With our systemic consensus, anyone can run a node. It's very low stake requirements. Um, so we can have much more decentralization at network level. Cool. I want to come back to the to the stack a little bit. Um, so, could you describe like what is the role of of M one? So, is M one like the the sort of shared sequencer that all M two chains are, are going to use? Uh, uh, yeah, and and then how does M one then connect into IBC and then all of the other like move chains that are part of the broader you know move ecosystem? So, you'll have M two as the main like fraction role. Think of like the optimism chain, um, the main chain. And then you have M1 as a sequencer, which is kind of analogous to Optimism's super chain sequencer. And then they have other move rollups launching the network. And all sequenced by the same um, sequencer set, which is M1, which is like the OP stack rollups. Um, so a similar business model there where it's focused on A, launching our sequencer off the bat, and B, on the next gen VM. So our stack will actually be complementary to OP stack, where you can use the OP stack, use the move stack for the VM, and connect to the sequencer. I think everyone was customizing a DA layer, customizing role frameworks, customizing improved marketplaces, but then not touching the EVM at all. Um, our stance is we don't believe that should be the case. We should we want experimentation at the VM level. If you're building a gaming rollup, which we've seen a lot of demand for, you probably want to use um, the move VM or SVM, something like that. Um, and yeah, the M1 sequencer connects all the different systems, allows for liquidity to be routed seamlessly. Um, and then Envision is you have these hundreds of rollups all connected to Ethereum um, with this decentralized sequencer set. 
Fascinating. And um, yeah, let's maybe just zoom in a little bit to where Celestia fits into all of this and how it supports the the rollups uh, being built on on top of Elm One. Yeah. So the thesis last year was um, ETH settlement and ETH DA is really expensive. If more like Optimism and Arbitrum, the fees are pretty high there. So how can we free Alt DA um, to really um, scale Ethereum rollups so that you can still be on Ethereum settlement, but post call data to a cheaper source? That's when Celestia, Eigen, Avail, even Nier now um, kind of position themselves as leaders in the space. Um, from there, uh, kind of like what roles like ourselves, Eclipse, um, Manta, et cetera, have already been focusing on is, okay, we're bringing alt VMs and next-gen VMs and different VM stacks to Ethereum. We need to use Celestia because if you have a paralyzed VM on top of Ethereum and you're not using alt TA, it's still being really expensive. Um, you will inherit the security of Ethereum, obviously it'd be a true L2 but the user experience could be pretty subpar, at least until full dang shorting is out, which is a few years out at this point. So that's kind of the thesis of using Alt-DA. That also ties into the kind of IBC narrative, which you touched on before. We're working with the union on being fully IBC compatible. They're building out soul like client machines for us. So um, essentially, if you want to do cross-chain swaps on top of M2, you can do that with IBC itself, uh, connect to Osmosis, connect to Juno, uh, connect to your favorite um, Cosmos zones um, or world chains or whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah. So we're recording this on March the 12th and De the Dank Hoon upgrade is going to be tomorrow. So kind of this will give us proto Dank sharding. I think it's pretty obvious that it's not going to be enough, but how much do you think it'll help the entire call data situation? Yeah, so it's going to be an exciting day tomorrow. Um, so looking forward to that. But um, to be quite frank, I don't think it's going to be that noticeable. Um, I've seen like some recent measurements and it, like I think it might be a few cents difference. Full day sharding, as we know it, is like three to four years out, um, which at that case, there we can reassess the needs for all DA. Um, but I think like Celeste can cut fees down by 99% today, um, while per day sharding is like 0.1%, something like that. So I don't think it really it really is a factor. I think user experience on main Ethereum will be a little bit better. Um, it's, it's the right step in the right direction. Um, but the, the, the truth of the matter is like Ethereum Foundation and like Ethereum itself, um, can't move as rapidly as like Celestia, Eigen, and third-party infrastructure groups. Um, so in the short term and mid-term, honestly, um, all DA sells the market. And what's the role of like restaking within the sort of movement story and how does Eigen layer fit into all of this? Yeah, so restaking has always been an interesting narrative. I think it's definitely probably the hottest thing right now, one of the hottest things. Um, people want to use Ethereum security, there's groups bringing it to Cosmos, there's groups bringing it to like Bitcoin, um, and it's just like kind of using more capital efficient markets. Um, we're seeing a lot of layer twos work with uh, resigning providers at the bridge contract level. So imagine um, you have like Arbitrum, you, depo you deposit ETH to Arbitrum, you can natively restake it with like Rio, Renzo, one of these players, um, and have extra yield. Um, so I think these are much like yield bearing strategies that layer twos are adopting. Um, I think the way we're approaching it is like also similar to that, like having a LRT at the bridge contract. If you're a family office or liquid fund, you have a lot of ETH, you want to deposit on a chain, you can re you can stake it on on an LRT on an LST and then restake it with LRT at the bridge contract level. Have it fully automated, so you don't need to worry about it. Have like extra yield that you wouldn't be able to get easily. Um, and the benefit of us is that because it's fully formally verified, it's actually the most secure way to restake ETH. So we talked a lot of liquid funds. The concern they have is okay, I want to earn yield, but security is really important to me. Um, I'm not a family office. I don't like to um, take a lot of risk. I just like hold ETH and sell at certain times. Um, so for them, the pitch is, okay, this is the best place to deploy ETH, restake it, earn the yield that you want and have it fully, fully verified. So it's not security concerns um, that you're actually worrying about. It actually creates a bigger narrative around insurance, which gets me excited because in the past, um, insurance has been really pretty much useless because of smart contract risk. There's actually a world where you can, because you have restricted ETH, you can use that as collateral for investment. Um, so if you're like using Aave or Uniswap on chain and you want to use restake as collateral, you can use, you can use Eigen Insurance, um, which is another part protocol they're working on, um, as collateral for the investment. So um, that's another ABS that's actually really exciting, uh, especially for Move, because the security gaps um, enable it to be um, much more risk adverse or much more risk better. Uh, which enables interest rates to be lower, which enables retail capital to come in more easily. Any thoughts on the rise of Bitcoin L2s? Because kind of we've in the in the past months or so, those have been all the rage, right? 
Yeah, I think like personally, I don't really understand. Oh well, I'm not that deep in the Bitcoin space, so like the Bitcoin programming space. I'm sure there's other people that can see better to it. Um, for my understanding, it's like a way for people to you take existing Bitcoin reserves, put it on chain, or put it into uh, where now like custody multi sigs or side chains and earn yield for that. So in the short term, it makes sense. It's a way to generate yield, um, and it's a way for layer twos or whatever you want to call it. Uh, to boost up TVL, I believe Merlin Chain got like two billion, three billion TVL in a week or something crazy. Um, and I think a lot of ecosystems are now looking at that. How can we acquire um, Bitcoin liquidity? In the past, wrap BTC was always available, but um, family offices, liquid funds don't really want to wrap BTC because the whole process, gas fees are really high. It's not a risk. So BTC L2 is enabled native Bitcoin to exist um, and be repurposed for yield. So I think what a lot of different groups are looking at is how can we integrate something like Babylon, um, integrate um, like the BTC accrued from there um, and earn yield for our system. Um, so something that we're looking into is, is there a world where we can be native BTC via Babylon or other infrastructure providers and have that used in DeFi? Um, but obviously we're experimental um, and probably more down the roadmap. But I think like Bitcoin itself is here to stay. I think the ETF proved that it's going to be like a currency of gold. It's not going to be very programmable. I don't imagine the next social or gaming app being built on these BTCL2s. I don't think that's possible at my current st- knowledge. I think it's just a way to repurpose BTC, which is cool. So I think short-term play makes sense. Long-term, I'm kind of unsure. But teams like us are looking to kind of leverage that for existing TVL security benefits. Yeah, I personally think that Bitcoin is going to play a, a bigger and bigger role in the Layer 2 narrative in the coming year. And... You know, a lot of that I think is fueled by you know the ETF bringing like lots more liquidity into the space, but also um, a lot of the kind of technical developments that are happening there. So I, you know, there, there was this uh, Bitcoin res- Renaissance event at Denver, and I think like half of the teams that were that were uh, that had booth there were were building some kind of restake Bitcoin product or liquid stake Bitcoin product, and and I think that you know given Bitcoin's position as like the largest and more secure blockchain. It makes a ton of sense for that capital to be utilized. Uh, well, one in DeFi through liquid staked assets. Uh, with now, whether like that's technically possible that you, you know you can do sort of trust minimized versions of Bitcoin on other chains is going to be very important. Like you know we don't want this just to be a multi sig. But then yeah, the security aspect I think is also huge. So like whoever figures that out uh, and brings it to market, I think will will do very well. I want to move on now to yeah. You, you guys announced uh, a couple of months ago a partnership with yeah Union and Noble, and I was really excited about this because uh, we're, we're all also very bullish on, on those two teams. Yeah, h- how does this um, help bring USDC to movement, and can you describe maybe like the role of Union in br- bringing IBC to you know the movement ecosystem, but also Cosmos and Ethereum? And sort of tying it all together so that we can have fungible uh, USDC across all these platforms. Yeah, I think like IBC has always been like regarded as like the most secure, one of the best bridging standards in the market. Um, and there's like a bunch of transport layers on top of that, um, which like layer zero, wormhole, um, hyperlane. Recently, wormhole is a as the worm chain, which is like gateway now, um, which is their cosmos adaption. Layer zero and hyperlane both have. Um, also, IBC and adaptions. You have Axlor as well. So all the biggest bridging protocols all use IBC under the hood, but they use it probably in a non-native way. Um, it's really difficult in the UX point of view to use them. Like for one, you have to bridge to the gateway and then bridge gateway to respective chains. Um, there's lack of native IBC connections. So there's a few groups that have emerged to kind of solve this problem. You have like Polymer Labs. You have like Composable Finance. You have Union Labs now. Um, they're now looking at different ways to bring IBC natively to systems. So part of our partnership with the union is they're working on building direct like client machines um, for a layer two. So if you're a DAP on top of movement, you can do transactions directly to osmosis, do it to other chains. Um, it starts off through the union chain, I believe, but eventually it'll, it'll be um, native IBC compatibility, which is really exciting because now you can have native USDC. Um, you have Adam, Tia, you can get the benefits of all the cosmos and assets that people want on chain without relying on a third party um, and secure bridge provider. But I think my general thesis is that IBC is the cosmos standard. I know we touched on this at the convergence, uh, where cosmos like, accomplishes the vision, the internet of blockchains, where every 
roll up every L1, L2, L3, whatever you want to call it. We'll use IBC as a main bridging provider, bridging standard on the hood. It's just depending on like where the wrappers on top of it and the transfer layers on top of it that facilitate that. Um, so you have like Wormhole doing it from like their point of view, which is more third party and more um, trust reliant. And you have like Union and Polymer, which are looking to kind of address the security assumptions and increase speeding times. Union specifically is looking at ZK IBC. They built out Comet BLS, which is a new standard uh, for messaging. Um, so I'm pretty excited and bullish on them, um, which is kind of why we're working with them. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned convergence because there's a couple of topics that uh, we we touched on at the event that I'd like to bring up here. So, you know, one of the topics that we talked about was uh, USD denominated asset dominance in crypto. So obviously like USDC and, and Tether are, you know, by a large margin uh, leading in stablecoin issuance, uh, you know, over things like like DAI and, and other decentralized stablecoins. Do, do you think this like um you know Corel from union was on the panel also uh and so I, I encourage those who haven't seen that to go check it out it's on the nebula summit youtube channel we'll link to it in the show notes but you know he was saying that you know he felt that there was a risk uh to crypto to having these well one like centralized centrally issued stable coins but also i think another topic that uh another sort of point that i haven't heard brought up very often is yeah you know this usdc denominated stable coin so this kind of like us alignment, US dollar alignment uh, risk. You know, do, you, do you see that as a risk? And uh, you know, wh- how, how can one mitigate that considering the fact that like these stable coins already have like such dominance over the space? So uh, yeah, we discussed like USDC dominance and my thing is like, I'm actually pro circle dominance in the short term because if we already have very few users on chain. And like, if you ever want like consumer safety right now, we need like a third party, like big provider, like Circle, Coinbase to really issue these assets um, and provide confidence to retail users. Like going back to my example of like family using crypto. Um, if I told them to use like DAI on a maker or like some of these other stable coin providers, they're probably freak out and be like, what is this? If I said it was like, okay, it's a stable coin issued by Circle, like now probably gonna be a public IPO company. Um, very U.S. regulated, has a lot of re- rules and regulations. They feel a lot more comfortable. So there's like two kind of markets here, right? You have like retail, which is like people who don't really know crypto at all. They want to explore with it. You need Circle. You need a Coinbase. You need centralized authority for them to feel comfortable. And then you have the experience on-chain DGENs. People have been trading for years. Um, they recognize that in the world that Circle kind of goes rogue or Coinbase goes rogue. Um, they want the ability to safeguard their holdings. That's why DAI is really interesting. That's why UCT is, like, is interesting. There's now it's like Athena, which is not a stable coin, but they're providing different in- investment kind of issuances. So I think there's different groups for those categories where you can provide solutions and stable coins and assets um, for more Web3 native people. But to bring in people to space, you do need centralized authorities. So I'm actually pro Circle, pro Coinbase issued assets. Yeah, I think that makes sense to me. I think in the short term, it makes sense. You know, looming in the back of my mind is always this censorship risk with USDC. I think that's really the main risk that I see. But as the space becomes more regulated, that is going to be the case also, most likely. Like, I mean, all applications and and dApps will be subject to uh, potentially like having to censor transactions that don't fall in line with like compliance. Yeah, in terms of, um, yeah, like this Cosmos and Ethereum convergence uh, idea, uh, which was the main main topic of the the panel in, in Denver. Yeah, what's the end game here for you? Like, in terms of Cosmos and Ethereum coming closer together and benefiting from each other's sort of strong points, uh, where do you see that heading towards? I think Ethereum is used for liquidity, um, is used for settlement security, while Cosmos is used for communication. Um, the Cosmos has a lot of different features. They have Tenement, they have SDK, they have IBC, um, they have Common BFT, um, there's a whole zone thesis with like custom app chains. I think a lot of the times the zones had a lot of struggle with obviously tokenomics and bootstrapping values. That's pretty difficult. Um, but the one thing that was always prominent and like beautiful was if you had multiple zones, you could use a Cosmos SDK and get connected to Osmosis, get connected to your favorite chains, um, and it's permissionless interoperability which is kind of like Hyperlane's motto, but I really see that kind of mantra spreading towards um, the theme and the modular stack where you're in this world where you have all these rollups and all 
ask for three chains. You don't want to wait for a third party bridge provider to always deploy. If I'm building a new gaming chain and I want to launch three weeks, I sure have to wait for layer zero um, or any other ch um, kind of third party bridge provider to deploy on top of me. I should be able to use IBC or some third party pretty standard um, to get connected to my favorite chains so I can sprint on my product. Um, so I think that's where IBC has a unique market where it enables for permissionless interop. I have a few different groups building wrappers on top of it, but IBC is a standard that's going to be adopted um, for this mass uh, welcoming of chains is coming. Whereas Ethereum is still like the programmable computer where people are building on top of it, um, using it for liquidity, using it as like a supercomputer, um, and then IBC is connecting on it. So I think the Cosmo Ethereum narrative and the Cosmo Ethereum vision is coming to fruition today, where maybe Cosmos zones don't win, but IBC wins, which means that Cosmos wins, and maybe that Ethereum layer, like Ethereum layer two and Ethereum DAs don't really make sense. Um, there's also a question about like, what is a rollup? Is, ro is If you're rolling on Celestia, does that mean that you're a rollup? Um, or is it mean L2? I think that's a frivolous debate. I think as long as you can Ethereum some, cap some, pa some capacity, um, it doesn't really matter. I think that if IBC wins, everybody wins. I think it's not so much about like, yeah. I think the end game is just, you know, and, and Ethan Buckman and, and Sam Hart were talking about this on, a, on an episode of, I think it was like one of the BlockWorks podcasts recently. And they were talking about the end game. And like the end game is all chains using IBC and benefiting from this amazing interoperability technology. And then, you know, if I take it even a step further, and this is sort of Corel's point of view, is that we, we have this swarm of validators that is validating the state of all these chains. And as an application, you know, like there's just, you don't know who's validating your your uh, your transaction, but it's it's being added to this massive sort of um, swarm of state, uh, this massive state that is secured by the swarm of, of, of validators. I kind of see that as the as the end game where Ethereum sort of sits at the bottom layer, provides the liquidity, provides a major part of the security, but Cosmos, you know, through its construction, through the construction of the, the Cosmos stack and been at the forefront of, of modular with the app chain thesis, brings the technology and the technical philosophy to build out applications in a way that makes sense. I'm 100% with you both that kind of IBC is kind of like the absolutely golden part of Cosmos. So I think this is something that kind of the Ethereum ecosystem is lacking. And, and bad uh, kids. We see it. Yeah. <laughs> and bad, I think bad kids always win. There was a podcast probably already a year, year and a half ago, also with Ethan on Bankless, interestingly, where kind of he argued his thesis that um, Ethereum is kind of like this empire where kind of everything ultimately settles back to Ethereum, where, whereas kind of Cosmos is like this network of city states with um, kind of like pockets of value. So now in this um, Cosmos and Ethereum convergence picture, how would that kind of translate into this metaphor? In terms of like cities and states, um, like where? Yeah, in terms of like having like a giant em uh, empire where basically everything is kind of like inverted pyramid shaped and everything ultimately set its back on mainnet where... So yeah. like that's, I would say like the United States, so like the US for example, the United States would be Ethereum. You have a bunch of different states, which is like, yeah, the movement is one state, you have like another roll-up is another state. You have all these different states that are all different roll-ups. And the highways that connect all the different states are is IBC, where you need like connectivity between the different states. Otherwise, if you're from California, you can't get to New Jersey. Um, if you're from like Oregon, you can't get to Florida. So that's like the main problem actually to crypto is like if you look at like earlier seller stage when America was first developed, this is probably just my inherent American coming out. Uh, but like the, when there was like really, it's really hard to like travel between different states and different regions back in old America when they built roads out and transportation properly, um, it was really easy to get between different states, which enable people to network easily and meet their family and friends. Same thing in today's crypto, where you have Ethereum, which is like kind of the barren land. Um, it's like it's like the 1700s, if you would say, um, where you have all the different states kind of forming, but still kind of figuring out what their markets are. Like, like California was a gold state at one point, New York was a financial hub. People were still trying to figure out their hubs in that case. And then the main thing that's missing is kind of the roads between different chains or in this case states um which the ibc's position to be the best candidate i would say like, ibc would be the asphalt in this case or the concrete 
and then like different groups this is getting really in depth to it but the, the, <laughs> like you have like union paul and we're in different groups that are actually building the specific roads if that makes sense we talked about adoption kind of depths that with of you know hundreds of millions if not billions of people in the very beginning kind of when we talked about um facebook's motivation to create move so what does the future look like um, for for Move and Ethereum, and kind of where, where, when do you think we'll see the first steps that actually have that sort of mainstream appear? Uh, to plug myself, I would say like our main net, um, but the the real answer would be like like it depends on what your real apps are. Like I don't, I, don't, I think there's no apps in crypto yet. We don't have any real apps yet. Uh, I'm talking about like we don't have like an on chain social app. We don't have anyone that my parents are talking, my friends are talking about. So we're still very early on that to like, I can, we can say like, oh, we'll have X amount of DeFi apps, X amount of TVL, but who really cares? It's just another like copy pasta of another layer two. We're trying to build infrastructure and apps um, that mainstream people can use, send payments at the speed of light across the world. Um, so I would say like the movie system is poised to uh, carry that thread on the best. A, because you have backing from two of the biggest consumer chains on the planet, and then B, um, like the language itself is designed for consumer development. Um, so I, I would say that within like three years, we could see like a really prominent consumer social app that gets a lot of traction. Um, but in the short term, you'll see like much, much more prol proliferant secure DeFi strategies um, compared to like traditional layer twos and traditional um, Ethereum solutions. Great. Do you want to share a little bit about, yeah, sort of short-term and roadmap for movement? When can we expect mainnet? And how can people start building on movement or perhaps getting involved? To get involved, like go to Discord, check out um, like our builders community, Movement Labs XYZ is a website. Follow me on Twitter at Ushimanche. And then we're rolling out a lot of stuff end of this month and starting with some announcements coming um, on fundraising as well as like Tesla and Aspid coming out next month. So DevNet's fully live as well as incentivized Tesla shortly. Awesome. Rushi, thanks so much for coming on Epicenter and uh, expanding our minds on the on the alt VM thesis and why movement is going to the moon. For sure, man. Thanks so much for having me. Really appreciate the time.